planning and structure, without a doubt, that has got to be key to absolutely everything. Without a plan and something we can measure, what doesn't get measured gets lost in translation. And then if we have no structure to our day or our week at least, everything becomes a little bit ad hoc and we start making poorer decisions. Shift work can be brutal, but it doesn't have to be. Welcome to A Healthy Shift. My name is Roger Sutherland, certified nutritionist, veteran law enforcement officer, and 24 seven shift worker for almost four decades. Through this podcast, I aim to educate shift workers using evidence-based methods to not only survive the rigors of shift work, but thrive. My goal is to empower shift workers to improve their health and well-being so they have more energy to do the things they love. Enjoy today's show. And welcome to another episode of A Healthy Shift Podcast. Today, I have just the most amazing chat with, I'm going to call him a colleague, Ian Cook in the UK. This chat is really something else. And I hope that you get great value out of it. You'll hear the chemistry. I think Ian and I really clicked and we really got along particularly well because we both understood and both related to what he was talking about. But today's episode is talking all about how to plan and structure around a 24-7 shift working life. Now, Ian is a 16-year veteran and is still a sworn member of the police in the UK. And you will hear that he's been to hell and back himself with his own health, and now he has fought his way out, and how he has fought his way out, and why he fought his way out of it. This is a really genuinely excellent chat, and I thank you for joining us, and I encourage you to listen to this right the way through to the end, because you'll hear just how genuine Ian is in the way he speaks about this topic, because it is really, really important. And he goes through the strategies, simple strategies and ways that we can all really learn from. So I'm not even going to bang on here. I'm actually just going to go straight into this episode. I would like to welcome to the show today, Ian Cook from the UK. How are you, Ian? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your experiences and how you go about doing things. So I'm really looking forward to our chat in relation to today. We're going to talk about how to plan and structure around a 24-7 shift working life. Now, you're actually a sworn member in the uh, police in the UK. That's right, isn't it? That's right, mate, yeah, in the West Mids. So for us poor Australians way down here underneath, whereabouts is the West Mids? Everyone knows where London is down the bottom end of the UK, but whereabouts is are you located? So if we look at where London is, I am further north and I'm right in the centre of the UK. So we cover an area called Birmingham, which some people argue, but commonly known as the second city in the UK. Okay. Probably about two hours away from Manchester and Liverpool. Wonderful. Okay. We don't talk soccer because I'm way out of my depth when I talk there. And as a Sutherland, I actually have to barrack for Arsenal, so I don't want to cause any major grief here, all right? So <laughs> if I have to choose a team, I have to go with the Gunners, but, you know, like, what can I say? Am I out of line? Well, no, not really, because they're top of the league at the minute, so they're doing they're doing well. Are they? Oh, oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. See, that's how good my knowledge is. <laughs> All right. So now, Ian, we've had a chat in the background beforehand, but I'd love to know why do you do what you actually do now? Well, I suppose my journey started at quite a young age, fifteen, sixteen at school, not really having very good body confidence, struggling with my food. Went to university got a degree in sport and exercise science and coaching, started the police. And as I've gone through my journey in the police, I've been in 16 years. The one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of police officers and a lot of emergency service workers struggle massively. They struggle with the shift pattern. They struggle with their eating habits and they struggle with having any sort of structure. And what I was seeing was I was talking to colleagues that I'd spoken to 10 years ago who'd still got the same problems they had 10 years ago. 
it kind of made me think, you know what, I think I can help and I think I can support these people. Unfortunately, we're just not taught in 24-7 shift working life how to go about it. They might give us a handout. They might give us a flyer. They might have a 15, 20-minute lecture. We hear how bad shift work is, but no one actually has ongoing structured training around how to deal with shift work. So people like us are eternally grateful for people like yourself that have traveled that journey, have seen the self-sabotaging mistakes that shift workers do make. And the good thing about you is you're in the police, so you get it from a police perspective. Worldwide, there are literally billions and millions of police. So you've got a great market there to be able to help and turn it around. Because I think one of the things that's really selfless about policing is you are sacrificing your own health to literally help others, aren't you? Yeah, and to be honest, that's the motto of my business, helping those who help others. The one big thing that I find is that we're expected to be like superheroes at times whereby we go to work, we give everything for everybody else, and then we kind of have no idea how to look after ourselves. And it gets to a point whereby there's a breaking point eventually and people will either go and find help and find structure or they won't and they'll fall into a bit of a black hole. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest problems that emergency services or frontline health workers make is they think, oh, this is how it is. So this is how it's got to be. This is shift work. But it's just not, is it, Ian? No, it's not. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think a lot of people accept it for what it is because it's been the norm for so long that people see it as just being how things are when in reality if they get a little bit of structure they get a bit of guidance and support and have a community of like-minded people that have made change it can inspire everybody to make change oh it's infectious in a workplace it's amazing how that works we'll talk about that a bit later too talk us through your background and what led you to where you are now you've talked about that you've i didn't realize you've got a degree in sports science yeah Yeah, so, I mean, my kind of plan in life probably wasn't to be a police officer, and that's probably the same for the majority of people that kind of join. I kind of fell into it a little bit in the fact that I did a degree in sports and exercise science coaching in the UK. And at the end of my degree, I saw an advert for being a police officer. I'd got a family member in the police, and... It was a time when the police were really looking to recruit. And I thought, you know what, I'd like to give that a go. Applied, got in, and I kind of forgot about my degree, if I'm honest. You get consumed by the role, get consumed by the job. And, you know, before I knew it, six, seven years had gone by and I hadn't really utilized anything that I'd just spent three years of my life doing. Yeah, I get that. But When you think about it, everything's laid out for a reason, isn't it? The fact that you went off and did what you did at the time, and even though you've gone off, see, I always wished that before I went into law enforcement, I always wished that I had done something before, whether it was a bricklayer or whether it was an electrician or no matter what it was, I always wish I'd done something else that I could do in the background as a part-timer. But you've had this bubbling away, like you've got it. And in all honesty, it's been sitting there in the background. And then once you identify, because that probably is what gave you the knowledge to identify that we've got a problem here and I need to be able to help with this. And that's what saw you doing it. Now, you are a current sworn member. So how long have you been in the police now, Ian? So I've been in the police 16 years in March uh, this year. And I would probably agree with you totally in the fact that because you get so consumed in the role, it's only when you look at yourself and you look at the habits that you've adopted that you look back at and you think, I know that this isn't right and I know that I could do it so much better. So my experience for the first six or seven years was that my eating habits were poorer than what I know they should be. I knew that I probably wasn't exercise it as much as what I should be and I hadn't got the habits and behaviors that I'd had previously and 
because I've got that background, it was as if like I thought, well, I'm letting myself down here. But I also can see that I've fell into the trap of falling into the norm of what the police is. That is so, so true. We all know that it's not right, but we go with it because we put it under the umbrella of, oh, this is what shift work is. You know, you've been in 16 years. So did you find that you put the midriff weight on, the uniform started getting tight, that you were starting to eat poor, you were starting to feel poor, your mental health was poor? Did you go down that line, Ian? Yeah, so I think when I joined, I was in a position, and it's quite an interesting position actually, that when I joined, I was probably about 11 stone. And I was 21, and I remember walking into a job and seeing a guy in front of me, and I thought, how on earth can I possibly do anything if you make an attempt to make off or do anything? I'm going to struggle. So I kind of went the other way and decided, well, it doesn't really matter what I eat because I need to get bigger. So I kind of fell into, well, I'll have a takeaway, uh, it doesn't matter this week. On that late shift, it's okay for me to do it. Then it happened on nights. Then I started doing it on earlies. And before you know it, you have fell into a bit of a trap of you're spending lots of money on food that you don't really need. You are putting weight on in an unhealthy way. Your mood and energy are starting to drop because you're not having the nutrients that your body's craving. And... In reality, you turn into somebody that you don't want to be. Oh, that is so, so true. I love that. Now, Ian, you've got a family, and could you talk us through what you have as a family, what the family life looks like? Yeah, so I've got two boys who are eight and five, and I've got a wife, Danielle, who I've been married to for 10 years. Life's good. She's been a primary school teacher for 14 years, and... She's only really ever known me as a police officer, which I think is a massive benefit because I think undoubtedly when we join, I think we tend to think that it's not going to change us, but I think it does in some way. So my wife only knows me as I am now and it works. We have to plan and we have to, you know, make sacrifices. She has to make sacrifices for me and I have to rely on her a little bit at times. But she's so supportive. She makes sure that, you know, if I need a little bit of sleep before night, she's there. She makes sure that that can be facilitated. My two boys are my world. And, you know, they're proud of daddy being a police officer. They love that. So, yeah, life's good. And I've got a very supportive family. That is unbelievable. It all comes down to communication, doesn't it, Ben? A lot of people... Their communication is in the heat of battle, I think, in emergency services and frontline health. It gets to the stage where it becomes a boiling cauldron and then it just goes off. And then nothing really is gained by that conversation at all. And I think one of the most important things is, and I think you touched on this, well, you didn't touch on it, you said it, and I think it's really important. People that come together when you are already working what you're working, they have dated you gone out with you, fallen in love with you and want to be with you as that particular person. Whereas if you weren't a member or you weren't in those, whatever you're doing in 24 seven shift work, and then you go into that, that's a massive adjustment, but it still comes down to communication. And I think having those conversations over a cup of coffee in the morning one day or during the day when you go for brunch and um, everything's all loved up and you go, hey, listen, just so that you know, this is what I need. This is what, because I think one thing that's not good is You know, like you've worked night shift and then you come home from night shift and then your wife says to you, you're home so you can take the kids to school. Could there be anything more dangerous than you putting your boys in the car and running them to school when you get back from night shift? That's horrendous. Like, yes, you are there and you've got to pull your weight. I understand that. But how dangerous is that? Yeah, and you know what? I think you've hit the nail on the head that you need to have – support and communication because I know my wife would never expect that of me. You know, when I come home, the first thing that she does is she says, look, get yourself to bed, get some sleep. You know, before a night shift, you know, she's very supportive in the fact that she'll say, go and get some sleep. If I come back after an early, we do 12 hours on my department. So as soon as I come back, the first thing that she's there to do is 
you know, do you need anything? You know, and it makes a massive difference because having that understanding with somebody who you live in the same household as is absolutely key to making sure that you remain on track. Because if I came back, you know, I needed to do this, this and this and I was starting to struggle and I couldn't get that sleep before nights. One, it's going to make me probably a bit niggly. It's going to affect family life and it's going to affect work. That's right. And see, Mrs. Cook is a clever woman because what Mrs. Cook's done is she knows that if you get home and you get to bed and you get that sleep, she gets the best of Mr. Cook when he gets up. This is the key. There's no point in flogging someone who's absolutely exhausted. And it comes down to that communication because she knows that when you come home from work, she says, okay, Mr. Cook, off to bed. And you go, oh, off to bed. Because she knows that if you go to bed and you get yourself a good solid five, maybe six hours or whatever, when you get up, you are happy, Mr. Cook. And then you are there for the boys to take the pressure off it. You can take them out on the bike. You can take them for a walk. You can do whatever. And that's how she gets the best of you. Otherwise, it just compounds in a really, really bad way. So I love that you guys communicate and you've got that, and you lovingly do it for each other because you've had that conversation and communication around it. I think that's just – it's a really big takeaway point for people who are listening to this podcast that if you've got a mixed relationship, when I say mixed as in one's a shift worker and one's not, it literally comes down to having that conversation. I think it's important. Okay, so let's get on and get into this question here, which if you had to single-handedly label – the biggest mistake that you see shift workers making on the job, not work-wise, but the biggest mistake that they make around their health and well-being, what would you label it? Planning and structure, without a doubt, that is has got to be key to absolutely everything. Without a plan and something we can measure, what doesn't get measured gets lost in translation. And then if we have no structure to our day or our week at least, everything becomes a little bit ad hoc and we start making poor decisions. Yeah, I totally could not agree more. It's the planning that lets us down. Planning for food, planning when to exercise, planning around family, planning when you can sleep, planning when you can do everything. And I think, you know, this is the topic that we're going to do. So what would you say or what do you advise clients? Well, you've identified that planning and structure is a problem. What's the simple strategy that they can put in place to help with that? Well, when I have a client come on board, the first thing that we do is we do a lifestyle audit. So once we've agreed, yes, we'd like to work together, what I like to do is get on a call and find out everything about them, what their shifts look like, what their home life looks like, what support networks they've got in place. And then when we do that, what I like to do is pick a day in the week whereby we can have a 15 minute planning session now that can be any day they like it can be on any sort of piece of paper it can be an app such as trello or anything like that and i like them to sit for 15 minutes and just look for a seven day period when they can do that they know what the shifts are going to be they can plan what days they need to maybe do a little bit of meal prep, what days they need to do their exercise, what days they've got to tick off and do certain things. And by doing it, it's 15 minutes out of a week that can make a massive difference to getting the results that you want and failing. I love this. So you use Trello, do you, Ian? Yeah, so I personally do, but what I've kind of realized is that for some people – Using electronic devices just isn't for them. So within my program, what I do is I create planners on paper that I send out to my clients and they get the choice. They can do it via Trello, they can do it via Evernote, or they can use the planners that I give them. But I like them to send me back on their given day and just say, look, this is my week, this is my 15-minute plan I can look at it and say, you know what, bang on, that looks really, really good. And I normally do that for probably the first month or so, just so I can see that I've got that structure and that plan in place and they've utilized those 15 minutes in the right way rather than just looking at it and putting everything down on a piece of paper with no real structure or plan in place. It's okay spending 15 minutes 
with the idea of getting the week sorted, but I'd prefer them to have 10 minutes of real good structured work and written down rather than spending 15 minutes and not get any real value down. Or how many minutes are there in a week where you end up doing nothing because you've got absolutely no plan? Exactly. And you know what? The biggest thing that I have is that people will probably do it for the first week and they'll message me and say, yeah, that's really been a massive difference. The second week when they've kind of got a little bit more structure in place, a little bit more of an idea of, well, that did work. So now that 15 minutes that they've set themselves all of a sudden becomes a lot more productive. They start planning in things that they didn't even consider the first week. And before you know it, you spend three or four weeks in and I don't even ask them to show me anymore because I know they'll take it upon themselves to send it me because they're proud of what they're achieving and they're proud of the achievements that they've made throughout the week. So that kind of real small little habit, and it is a habit because for some people, they'll go into a week and they'll have no plan in place and everything becomes very ad hoc and every day is a bit of a guess. But as soon as you put that 15 minutes in, and it really does just take 15 minutes, just put it in place, spend 15 minutes once a week and just get your day sorted. It can make a massive, massive difference. And as soon as people cotton on to how easy it is, it changes their lives forever. Without doubt, I see that we have big problems with shift workers in every single shift working industry about lack of planning. And I think for those people that are listening, what you're hearing here right now is absolute gold. You are allocating 15 minutes. Now, don't anybody ever tell me that you don't have 15 minutes. And I always go by action precedes motivation. And it does because literally what you've just done there is saying that taking an action precedes the motivation to do more. By week one, they're just putting a couple of things in. And that's good because it's a success, isn't it? That they tick those things off with it being realistic. And I'm sure you get them come back in the first week that you've got people and you look at it and you go, oh God, you've got to be kidding. There's no way you're going to get all that done. And you say, listen, what about if we take this, 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 and this out and you just achieve that? Because it's like someone who says, oh, I'm going to do five workouts this week. And you say, no, no, we're going to aim for three. Tick those three off. Because if you aim for five and you only get three, you feel like a failure, don't you? Absolutely. Hit the nail on the head. Exactly what I do. I will only ever give people one or two small habits at the start to try and implement and try and tick off. Because I think if you try and overload, the one thing that we will do is overwhelm. And when we become overwhelmed, we inevitably start to get fears of failing and we get a little bit of anxiety. And that's going to make a massive impact on ability to lose body fat. Oh, yeah, because it becomes stressful, doesn't it? We don't want it to become stressful. We want it to be really, really easy for people Because we are going down that road. We know that this works because we do it. We know how it works. We know that planning and structure, a whiteboard, a chalkboard, or a piece of paper, a template, make a template up, print it off six times. You've got six weeks worth. Stick it on the fridge so that you can see it every day. Today, Monday, okay, this is what I've got to do. I know. This also comes down from a psychological barrier as well, because we end up with decision fatigue because we have to make so many goddamn decisions every single day. If you can spend 15 minutes making the decisions for the week, this is what I'm going to do, this is when I'm going to do it, this is how I'm going to go about it, bang, done. So I I, I did a post on this that we talk about. The first thing you do for your seven days ahead is write your roster down because that's a non-negotiable. You have to turn up for that, right? So you put that down. Then you put down your absolute must-dos. Got to get little Johnny to dance school or you got to get little Sarah to whatever. Then what you do is you then add in where you can literally fit the things around it. And that takes you 15 minutes to sit down and plan it out. That's it. It's done. You've written it, put it on the fridge. You never have to think about it. What people don't realize is, is literally how well this works 
for a 24-7 shift worker. It works phenomenally well. So those that are listening, have a think about what it would be like for you to have already spent the 15 minutes planning it. It's now on your fridge or you've got a whiteboard somewhere or you've written something down and you've got it as a ready reckoner, so to speak, and you can look at it and go, okay, so I don't have to worry about this because I don't have to worry about this because I'm doing that tomorrow or I'm going for a walk here or I'm going to go to the gym this day or I'm going to do whatever. And it's a visual reminder for you as well. And people say, oh, I've got it in my calendar in my phone. It doesn't work that way. It needs to be a visual reminder. I think that's absolute goal for people. I've said this, that you know, I have found that the absolute best thing that a shift worker can do is to plan their week out in a realistic term. Don't put ridiculous expectations on yourself. Now, you are huge on the planning side, and I love this, and this is one of the main reasons why you know I get you onto this podcast to literally talk about this planning side of it. And I think people will have had massive light bulb moments there where they will have gone, oh, my God, why didn't I think of that? And that's what we're here to do, to save them, aren't we? We're doing the thinking for them. Well, I think when you kind of speak to people, especially people who become clients of mine, Sometimes I think they'll say, this seems too simple. It seems like it can't work because it, it's such a simple thing to implement. And I always say the simpler, the better, because if we try and crack an algorithm by trying to recreate a wheel, I said, we're never, ever going to do that. I said, what we need to make is things very, very simple, that are easy, quick, and simple to implement. Because if we try and make it too difficult, in the lives that we've got with families, work, everything else that we're trying to fit in, all that's going to do, we're going to overwhelm ourselves and it's not going to work. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you are, please don't forget to rate and review once you've finished. This helps the show's reach enormously. And have you got my free ebook, The Best Way to Eat on Night Shift? Well, this is a comprehensive guide to the overnight fast why we should fast, and how to best go about it. I've even included a few recipes to help you. I've put a link to the ebook in the show notes. And are you really struggling with shift work and feel like you're just crawling from one shift to the next? Well, I've got you. If you would like to work with me, I can coach you to thrive, not just survive, while undertaking the rigours of 24-7 shift work. I also conduct in-house live health and well-being seminars where I will come to your workplace and deliver evidence-based information to help your well-being team to reduce unplanned leave and increase productivity in your workplace. I've put the links in the show notes to everything mentioned. You can find me at healthyshift.com or on Instagram at a underscore healthy underscore shift. Now let's get back to the show. Ian, you come from a position of experience and knowing, and that's why you can talk about that. And that is why people like myself, like you, like Grace, like Reese, this is why these people who I absolutely love hearing what they're talking about, and no disrespect to these doctors and professors that are studying and researching, but they've not done it. They don't get it, right? They, people can talk to them. They can talk to all the people in the world that they want to talk to. They can conduct research. They can do everything. And I'm not discrediting them. But what I am saying is the people that have actually done it get it. They know what brain fog's like. You know what I love about this planner more than anything else? It's free. <laughs> well, the biggest thing people always say to me is that they kind of look at it and say, well, you know what? I'd pay a lot of money for somebody to be able to give me something so simple that's going to change my life. And I say, well, you know what? It is completely free. You have the ability to make this as successful or as unsuccessful as you want it to be. And it's down to you to implement those 15 minutes every single week. It doesn't have to be any longer at all. As as soon as you become efficient at looking at your week and looking at your shift pattern, looking at what you've got to implement over the week, it'll probably get down to 10 minutes because you become that good at it. I mean, it literally takes me probably on average about 10 minutes now just to look at my week, look at now what clubs I've got for my boys, look at what things me and Danielle have got on and to look at what shifts I'm working. And then from there, I can plan what I need to get done. Depending on what I'm working, the way that my shift pattern works is that 
for a month, I will probably work every weekend. What I like to kind of do is when I'm not working a weekend, I find that my planning session on a Sunday is very much based around, okay, let's plan some family time in. That's the non-negotiable for me. And a lot of people will always, I think when people start a new lifestyle, they think they have to suffer in some way. <laughs> and they have to, I had a client actually a couple of days ago message me and say, this doesn't feel real because I'm not suffering. I'm not cutting all the things that I enjoy out. And I said, no, I said, what I want you to do is I want you to go the other way and I want you to plan all the things that you enjoy. I said, because this has got to be a sustainable long-term solution rather than a suffering of three or four weeks. You get to the point where you can't do it anymore and then you go back to square one. Now, the other thing too with this, Ian, is not only is it important to put in the non-negotiables, but we have to make ourself a non-negotiable at certain times as well, don't we? What you said there, people find it enjoyable because they're looking at their schedule, which we all know, You've got exactly the same 24 hours as I've got, no doubt about it. The difference between you and Karen, who is really struggling, is I'm structured and done. I know what my week looks like, whereas she's just bogged down and overwhelmed. When it's laid out, you find that more time opens up for yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it is the absolute game changer. You know what? The nutrition side is obviously very important, but without a plan and without a structure, you won't get the exercise done and you won't get the food right. Absolutely, totally. And even if it's to schedule in half an hour a day to curl up in a chair with a book and read a book, that's self-care just for yourself. But you don't have to schedule that because you suddenly find you've got half an hour to actually do that. And I love this. A lot of people will be going, oh my God, you know, like, why haven't I been doing this as well? So now I just want to talk about the meal planning side of things as well, because I had Angela on the Healthy Diary who talked about her no prep meal prep and how to go about doing that. Talk to us about the benefit of having like a home prepared food at the ready while you're on shift so that you're not caught out, your colleagues going through the golden arches or is going to grab something on the run or not eat at all, which is very common as well, isn't it? People don't eat and then they get home and then they overeat and then they go to bed and it impacts on sleep and there's massive problems. So it's a game changer in itself, just having it there and ready and knowing what to have, isn't it? Yeah. So what I always kind of advocate at the start is to start at a very minimum. So we kind of look at when we start a shift, what do we normally have with us and the majority is well we don't have anything and when i ask why it's because well i haven't got anything to carry in for a start so the first thing i say is well should we get ourselves a call bag should we get ourselves something that we can actually put some food in for a start then what i ask them to do is on their planning session let's look at maybe a couple of days whereby we can bulk cook some food now for me, that's very important because we're all busy. We've all got different things that are going to take our mind and our priorities. So if we can have some food that we've already cooked that – I don't know whether you have over there ninjas. Yep, we do, yes. Yeah. So, you know, if you can slow cook something in a ninja, get something that is easily accessible that you can just take out, put into a container, put in, we already know – what we've put in there. We know the ingredients. It's quick and easy. I'm a massive fan of smoothies. The one big thing that I kind of get a lot of is that I don't get my refs. We've got too many jobs. We haven't got enough staff. I don't get any time to sit down and actually eat. Yep. So what I am a massive advocate of is actually getting a smoothie that you can take with you, keep in your call bag, and you can drink whilst you're on the go. It saves that moment of weakness and it is because we're hungry we're not hydrated we see a takeaway like a Mackey's or a KFC or a Subway and it's the easy option because we are hungry and our bodies are craving food and our mind is telling us that we need it whereas if we have something that as we've already got it's quick easy we can drink in the car while we're on the go it's a game changer for a lot of people So, yeah, I'm a big advocate of bulk cooking. I like smoothies because, like I say, I just think it's something that can be done very, very quick and easy the night before, and it's something you can keep with you all the time. And a smoothie is something that people forget. 
that you can keep in a thermos as well. You know, people go, oh, no, I've got nothing to put it in. Yes, you have. You've got a thermos. When we think thermos, we think hot coffee. That's the first thing we think of. But we forget in the depth of winter that we can put a soup in it and we can carry a soup with us. A highly blitzed vegetable soup to have in your thermos overnight. Nothing beats it. And then to have in the summer or even any other time, you could put a smoothie straight into your thermos and it's going to maintain its temperature in there as well. The same way. So people, I think (laughs) the most important piece of kit that a shift worker can have, particularly someone who's on the road, paramedic, police, fire, et cetera, you've got to have a thermos. And I always advocate the wide mouth thermos because you can put a stew in it, you can put a curry in it, you can put a chili in it, you can put anything in it. And you've always got hot food with you on the go at all times. So I think that's being prepared. And I love what you said there. The first question you ask someone is, so when you head out today, what food are you going to have? Well, nothing. Well, where does it get you? It gets you nowhere. You are behind the eight ball to start off with because you know that you're going to have to make a decision at some stage. Oh, I'll get something healthy while I'm out. Well, what's healthy? And then the next thing is you get run off your feet with jobs, et cetera, and then you've got no time to eat and all of a sudden the golden arches catches you out the corner of the eye and you think, oh, I've just got to get something. And that snowballs, doesn't it, Ian? It snowballs into becoming a habit. That's what you do. Yeah, and I think very quickly what you can find is, and I think there's certain shifts that probably – you're more susceptible to do it. For example, you don't bring anything on night shift. I mean, over the 24-7, you drive past at 2 o'clock in the morning and it's very easy to drive in. When you do two night shifts, you can do that twice in a week. Yep. Well, there's probably £15 you've just spent. Yep. Yeah. You know, and then you do the next set. And before you know it, you've probably spent £100 at work on food that hasn't really served you very well, isn't nutritious, and he's probably having a real negative impact on your health. Yeah, and when you say not nutritious, it's not very satiating either, is it? It just goes through you like a dose of salt. So don't get me wrong here, Ian. I don't demonize food. That's all it is. It's just simple. It's just food. But the thing is, we have to make decisions around what's going to be satiating and what's going to keep us nutritionally sound and what's not. Now, if you're there and you're looking at two different foods, you've got to ask yourself – What is going to keep me fuller for longer? What's going to actually fuel me? When you change that mindset, it's really important. I actually recommend to my people as well that one of the good takeaways that you can actually get, people say, I can't get anything healthy. Well, you can still eat well. And you know those kebab vans that they have on the corners? I'm sure you guys have them in the garages because you've got to get a dirty kebab on the way home from a night out on the gas. So you can go to one of those and you can actually ask them for a naked one. Like you can actually just get the meat and the salad with without the Greek yogurt or whatever you're going to get, or garlic yogurt, and you can just have that on the run. Like you can just have the meat. You're getting the protein. You're getting – of course, it's not ideal, but it's a hell of a lot better than driving through. You know, you can't convince yourself that you're getting carbs and you're getting protein when you're sitting there eating a Big Mac. It's just – it doesn't work that way, does it? Well, I think one of the big things that I try and implement early on, and the one thing I will never do is try and overload people with carbs, fats, and looking at into that. What I like to do is let's have a real good look at the amount of calories that we're eating, and let's focus on getting a good level of protein in us. And what I always say is the reason why is because the one thing that I think shift workers struggle with massively is hunger. We'll go four, five, six hours without food. And I said, look, if we can have snacks that are available that are relatively high in protein and fiber, it's going to keep us feeling full for longer. But the other thing that I find massive when we talk about food prep, and it's probably something that's not really looked at by a lot of people, is hydration. You know, we all think that prep is all about food, the food that we consume, but you being able to be hydrated and make sure that you don't fall into feeling dehydrated is massive because you're going to start having lack of mental clarity lack of energy and it's going to affect your work and it's going to affect your decision making but it can also affect your hunger it's very interesting that because i do push very hard hydration and the reason why i push hydration very hard for a lot of people is as well because it comes from the same sector in the brain we can actually confuse dehydration for hunger and if you have that drink and wait you can actually find that I actually wasn't hungry I was actually thirsty because you know the signals get very confused so 
I like that. The reason why shift workers are very hungry as well, I think it's important to note, is hunger and satiety hormones are very, very skewed as a shift worker because of our fatigue levels. And fatigue can come from a lot of areas as well. It can actually come from areas where we're vitamin D deficient, where we are uh, lack of sleep for the obvious reason, but also dehydration brings fatigue as well, doesn't it? And we find that topping up our vitamin D, supplementing and actually getting that hydration in as well and focusing and prioritizing our sleep, it actually brings that leptin and ghrelin back in line because when ghrelin is elevated through fatigue, That's when we just want those highly palatable carbs and fats because our body is searching for instant fuel to get us going. But it's a little trick of that ghrelin, so we have to be very careful. But I want to ask you this, though. Let's just say you and I work in the car, though, Ian. We're working the car together, and you're on a mission, right? Everybody knows that Ian Cook is the health freak, right? And they'll just say to you, look, I know it's wrong, I know it's wrong, but I'm just going to go through Maccas. When they do, no, I'm going to stop and grab Maccas because that's what I'm going to do because I don't really care, right? I do care, but I don't know any different. What do you do? How do you cope with that yourself mentally? Because you know you've got your prep food or whatever, What do you do? For me, it's all about having and understanding your why. Because the one thing that I think can be very easy to do is to go, you know what? Yeah, I'm just going to go and I'm going to have that McDonald's. But we all know what's going to happen as soon as you've had that McDonald's. We're going to start feeling that little bit of guilt. Why have I done that? Why have I had that when I've got this food with me? We've given in to a little bit of social pressure. Now, look, I'm not suggesting for a second that you shouldn't enjoy a McDonald's every now and again. Oh, I would. It's bloody disgusting. But anyway. (laughs) You know what I mean? But I think think there's a a thing in life whereby we've got to try and find a balance. And, you know, for some people, for them, it's I'm going to have that McDonald's and it doesn't really matter. But for me, I know what my why is. I want to be able to be good at work, have good energy. I know that when I have that McDonald's, the one thing that's going to happen is I'm going to immediately, probably two or three hours later, be hungry again. Exactly. I'm going to immediately start to feel a little bit sluggish. Yep. And it's probably going to go right through me because it's not something that I normally consume. Yeah, that's exactly right. But we don't demonize it. And I've probably been harsh. I couldn't tell you the last time I had McDonald's. I reckon it would have been Probably eight to 10 years ago, I would have had Maccas, I think, without any doubt whatsoever. But that's not because I've demonized it. It's just something that I just don't want. I think if you said to your client, you're not to have McDonald's, I don't care what happens, you're not to have McDonald's, that plays a trick that all they go is, oh, my God, I want Maccas, but I just won't tell him because my colleague's going through. But if you say to someone, what I want you to do is I want you to have Maccas once a week. I want you to choose a shift that you're going to choose to have Maccas with your colleague on that day, it takes the demonizing out of it, doesn't it? What happens there, though, is that you get to a point whereby all of a sudden their habits and behaviors previously were that ingrained that they were used to having that McDonald's. And now when they've got the ability to actually have one, they don't want to. Exactly right. It's so true. Or I'm not going to have it tonight. I might have it tomorrow night. Then tomorrow comes and they haven't even given it a second thought. It's an absolute mind game, isn't it? That you literally, people just don't understand this. It's like the person that says, oh, I can't have chocolate in the house because I'll just eat it all. If you tell someone you must have five blocks of chocolate in your house at all times, you're welcome to eat it any time. People go, you're kidding yourself, Rog. There's no way can I do that. I'll eat it all every time. You actually don't. You're giving yourself permission to have it. And when you give yourself permission to have it, it literally throws a switch in your head. It makes a great big difference. It's gold. I love that. Now, Ian, what are your non-negotiables that people can easily implement to stick to? Like if someone comes to you to start off with, what are your non-negotiables that people can do? The first one is the planning. For me, that 15 minutes is a non-negotiable. Hydrating upon wake, that is something that I don't see why you can't do. I like to give a non-negotiable in terms of hydration for the day as well. Normally, that's around asking them what they've been used to consuming because what I don't want to do is say, I want you to have two and a half litres of fluid a day when they've only been drinking one. It's kind of very much based on what they've been doing, but let's try and implement a habit where we increase it. Probably the third one is steps. I like to have a minimum standard of movement for a day. I like to do a variance between it. So what I like to do is 
Because I know there's a lot of people out there that will go, you've got to do 10,000 steps a day. I kind of sit there and I shake my head and I just think, why are we putting the pressure on for that? So what I tend to do is I'll ask them what they normally do on a normal day. And then from that, we'll probably look and I'll say, okay, for example, they say 6,000. Well, I'll say, okay, you're normally six. So why don't we look at maybe doing six to eight? And then we know that our minimum for the week is 42,000. And we know that our maximum is 56. And if we can get in between that, we know that we've done well. And to me, that's a non-negotiable to hit those. Don't worry if you're a little bit off on one day because let's take it over a week rather than putting that pressure on each day. Because if you're on a night shift, are we really going to get our steps in? I'd like to think so, but we might not. So let's kind of see as a week rather than just an individual day. I love it. And I think people need to look at it over the period of the week without any doubt whatsoever. And I totally subscribe to what you're saying. And you know, with the hydration as well, I mean, I push it all the time. It's so important. It's not eight cups or two litres or a gallon or whatever it is. It is literally, you know, as a general rule, your urine needs to be clear, and that's the scientific measurement for being hydrated. But our ladies as well, a lot of them, because they're in the position where it's so much harder for them to go to the bathroom for the obvious reason, you know. So they can't hydrate like during shift or they have this fear of hydrating during shift in case they get caught out. And I get that. I totally understand it. But there's still time outside of the shift where you can literally top yourself up as well, other than the time you sleep or before you go to sleep because you don't want it to impact on your sleep as well. So I love those because they are simple strategies to put in place, really, really simple. And every single one of those is free. And this is where I just think, and I just want to say this, what's the importance of having a coach as a shift worker. Like people are going to listen to this podcast and they're going to say, oh yeah, no, I can do all of that. Why should they hire you or hire me as a shift work coach? One word, accountability. Yeah, done. (laughs) I was hoping you would say that word. It's accountability. It's having someone that's got your back, isn't it? Someone's going to support you all the way through. Yeah, and I know you've mentioned Grace and Reese. I I, I don't know them, but I know of their social media and you know what, the one thing that they've done is they've lived it, that they've lived it and they understand. And Spot on. it's very difficult to be accountable to someone that has never done it. They will look at it and say, well, I expect you to have done this, this and this, when in reality, it was never really on for you to do that. So to be accountable to somebody that understands, has a real understanding of what life looks like and what shifts look like, for me, is the biggest thing. You can probably name several of the reasons why it's important to have a coach. But for me, the biggest thing is the accountability side of it, because life can get very difficult as an emergency service worker and shift worker. So it's nice to have that shoulder to kind of lean on and that voice to have it in the back of your ear to say, okay, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. I know you're feeling, and this is how we're going to navigate it together. Oh, I love that. I get it. It's the best thing. Hey, I get it. I always say to clients, did anyone die? Like I've fallen off the track one day. Did anyone die? No. Okay, let's move on. We pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we keep going. Because it's very easy for someone who's not done shift work to actually look at a roster and go, well, you can get a workout in here, you can get a workout in here and here because you've got 12 hours off. So you're going to sleep for eight. That gives you four so you can do that. It doesn't work that way, does it, eh? It doesn't. And the amount of people that have come to me and said, I've had a previous coach that wasn't a shift worker, wasn't in the emergency services, and they've asked unrealistic expectations of me. And then when I haven't done it, they've said that, I'm not dedicated enough. Not committed. I don't want it enough, yeah. And they've said, like, you know, for a couple of weeks, I felt like that I didn't want it enough, when in reality, it wasn't that I didn't want it. I just couldn't fit my lifestyle into what they were asking. Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Ian, is it possible to thrive instead of just surviving while you're working 24-7 shift work? 100%. I think if you believe that it's not possible that's why you need a coach. I love that too. (laughs) I've got some gold from you today. I think that's fantastic. If anybody is listening to this and you are saying to yourself, 
these guys don't get it. I'm going to call you out on that. And you can challenge me any time that you want. I'm happy to sit here. In fact, I'll podcast it and I will debate it with you. I'm more than happy. Feel free to reach out to myself or to Ian, because I can tell you now, you'll have myself, you'll have Ian, you'll have Grace, you'll have Reese. We were more than happy to debate it. If you don't think you can thrive instead of just surviving shift work, you're wrong, because we will support you. We will literally put our arm around you and guide you as to how you can thrive and not just survive. I think This has been an incredible podcast. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you, Ian. You know, if you've said things or someone goes, oh, my God, I need this bloke as a coach, because I'll I'll be honest with you too, when you share this and it goes to the UK, I think it's important that people that are in the police in the UK have someone that resonates with them, speaks the language, so to speak, as well. So if you've said something that resonates with people and they think, oh, my God, I want to thrive, I don't want to just survive this, I need to go through this with some accountability from someone, where can people find you? Okay, well, there's two spaces that I've got. My Instagram, which is at Blue Light Lifestyle, and then I've got a private Facebook group, which has 700 members, which are all emergency service workers from police, fire, nurses, paramedics, whereby I post daily content inside free resources just to try and give that support and offer a community of like-minded people that are looking to try and thrive in their role what was the facebook group is it blue light lifestyle as well yeah it's blue light lifestyle so if you put that in the search engine you'll see my group pop up there's a couple of questions just some membership questions at the start the only reason why that's useful for me is just to know who's kind of coming in and what emergency service worker is looking for the support so i could kind of tailor the content that i'm putting out I must go and have a look at that myself, I think. I hope you're going to share the podcast into that group to let people hear because this has been absolute gold. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Now, I have a closing question that I ask people, Ian, and I'm I'm going to run this one by you as well. Now, if I've just recently won a billion dollars and I get to build you or buy you a holiday house anywhere in the world, but you've got to live in it for six months. Now, the wife and the boys, you can all go because you've earned it. By the time you finish coaching shift workers and work shift work yourself, I don't even know how you juggle it all. I know it's incredibly difficult. For six months of the year, you're going to live in this house that I buy or build, and I will give you carte blanche. You can put it anywhere you want in the world. Whereabouts am I build, building it or buying it? On the south coast of Spain, <laughs> as a youngster, I was very fortunate that my grandma had an apartment right on the coast and I had many, many happy summers there and it just brings back great memories. My boys have been a couple of times and for me, that would be where I'd be going. Beautiful. It's called Costa del Sol, the coast of the Love that. And you could do a lot worse than living on the south coast of Spain. There's no doubt about it. Ian, I'm very, very indebted to you for coming onto the show and sharing your time. I know it's late in the evening there, and I do sincerely appreciate it. But I can tell you now, it's been well and truly worth it. You've shared some absolute gold. And I'm actually going to go and join your Facebook group as well, because I want to see what you're doing. I'm going to go snooping. You have to let me in, right? (laughs) You are more than welcome. And I just want to say a massive thank you to you, because... There isn't many people that I think cater for emergency service workers, but the work that you do and the content that you put out is absolute gold. And I think you do a great job. And the people who are your followers and the people that you work with are really lucky because I think you do an absolutely amazing job at it. I sincerely appreciate those kind words. Thanks very much, Ian. No worries, mate. Thank you very much for the time and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Appreciate it. Well, pardon me while I just wander off and scratch my ego. That is if I can get out of the door. All I want to say is thank you so much to Ian. Honestly, It's like sitting across a table having a chat with a colleague when you sit there and chat with Ian. It really was such a great chat and I could have gone on and on and on. Such a genuine man with such passion to help people in this space and I just absolutely love that. If you enjoyed it, please share. Share it into your groups and your work groups. It's really important that people 
particularly our shift workers learn that structure and routine is game changing for a shift worker and it really, really does make such a difference to your life. And don't forget, give it a rating. Give it a review if you've got a few minutes to just write a little review. I do really, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you get notified whenever a new episode is released. It would also be ever so helpful if you could leave a rating and review on the app you're currently listening on. If you want to know more about me or work with me, you can go to ahealthyshift.com. I'll catch you on the next one.